Welcome to Europe Spaceport here in French Guiana and to your front row seat for the launch of the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer on an Ariane 5 rocket. Our rocket is here on the launch pad with the Drew spacecraft on top, ready to begin its journey. Over the next couple of hours, we will bring you live coverage of launch operations directly from here. The Jupiter Control Center. And from here, ESA's mission control at the European Space Operations Center in Germany. So this is where we're getting the first signals from the spacecraft after launch and confirmation that the solar panels have deployed. We'll be discussing exactly what makes this spacecraft so special. I'm Matt Russell. I'm Bruno Souza. I'm Raphael Chevrier. And I'm Lisa Peterson. And welcome to flight VA260 on the first leg of JUICE's journey into space. Following yesterday's postponement due to bad weather, Ariane 5 is now ready for launch here at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. With her single passenger, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE, safe and sound under the fairing. Liftoff is scheduled in just under half an hour. I'm right here in the aptly named Jupiter Mission Control Room. This is the nerve center of today's mission. And you can see here on the other side of this protective glass, which we call the fishbowl here in Kourou, you can see the teams working hard on the last preparations towards today's mission. Opposite me here, we have the partners, VIPs and guests all comfortably seated and waiting for liftoff. And with me right here for an update, we have Stefan Israel, CEO of Ariane Space. Welcome, Stefan. Good morning, please. Thank you very much. So we're back here together. Uh, so can you first of all maybe tell me, 24-hour delay, uh, what, what was uh, the reason for this delay yesterday? So very simple. The launcher was ready, juice was ready, the launch was ready, but the weather was not with us. You know, we have to monitor two risks, uh, high altitude winds, and it was okay, but risk of lightning yesterday was a real risk with a cloud uh, to, to monitor, and so we have made uh, the decision not to lift off yesterday. But of course, as we always say, better be safe than sorry. Juice can absolutely afford to wait another day under the fairing, not a yes, problem. Yes, for sure, because you know that once we will have done our job, after 27 minutes and once we will have orbited uh, Juice on an escape orbit, then it will be the start of an eight-year journey. So one day is nothing as compared to what we have ahead of us. We will monitor the weather now in the final minutes. The teams have worked all night. All is red up to now, so uh, we all are now... Green. Uh, all now. is green up to now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and we can see it on the status quo, and we get some clapping here from the crowd. It's a part of emotion for such an important mission. It's going to bring us very good luck. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. all is green. And so at 9.14, we will lift off. At 9.14, we'll lift off. Thank you so much, Stefan, and fingers crossed, good luck uh, for today. And we'll see you later. Thank you so much, Stefan. <laughs> and Stefan is getting a round of applause in here in Jupiter. Of course, an emotion which is easy to understand, uh, obviously, considering the conditions of uh, yesterday's delay. But everything is fine, safe and sound under the fairing, as we said. So, uh, as the teams working here in Jupiter Control, more than 7,000 kilometers away over the Atlantic at uh, ESA's uh, Mission Control Center in Darmstadt, Germany, we have the teams there who will take over control of the aircraft once it separates from the mothership. And we're going to go straight over and speak to them and hear how things are looking over there in Darmstadt. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Lisa, and hello to all our watchers. Welcome to ESOC, the European Space Operations Centre uh, here in Darmstadt, Germany, in the heart of Mission Control, I am. Uh, my name is Matt Russell, and I'll be your host for the second half of this JUICE broadcast. And behind, we have Bruno Souza in the actual control room itself. So uh, hello, Bruno. Uh, try and give us an update of what's happening in there at the moment. Hi, Matt. We're still getting goosebumps all day, although to this time a bit more cautious goosebumps. But we are ready to go. And in fact, just a few minutes ago, the flight director, Andrea Komatsu, just did the roll call and got to go from everybody here in the room. We have some footage of that and we're going to replay it for you. To all stations, this is Odi on the briefing loop for the roll call. Please reply on my call with your call sign and your status, go no go. 
OM. OM. Go. Som. Som go. Data handling. And data handling go. EOCS. EOCS go. Platform. Platform go. Flight dynamics. Flight dynamics go. Project rep. Project rep go. Project support. Project support go. Softcord. Softcord go. Software support. Software support go. S-track. S-track go. Scheduling. Scheduling go. Thanks. This completes the roll call for the Juice mission. We are go for launch. So as you just saw, we are fully ready to go. We're just waiting for that rocket to get off the launch pad. Thanks so much, Bruno. Well, we're running out of time here, so we're back over to you, Lisa, in Carew, and a uh, massive good luck to you. Thank you from the teams in Darmstadt. And hey, the pressure's on. They said all we're waiting for is that rocket to take off. Well, they've told us they're ready. The rocket is ready, but we want to know about JUICE. And we have Mihaela Barbo from ESA, who's here to tell us all about it. Mihaela. How ready is JUICE? Good morning. JUICE is actually ready and excited to start this journey. As we speak, my colleagues are closely monitoring the satellite. So yesterday, after the launch postponement, the satellite was switched off. And slowly in the day, around 7.14 p.m., it has been turned on to start the countdown procedure. They are very close to us, a few kilometers away in LBC control room. And everyone is hoping for good weather specs. Fantastic. So we have a bit, bit of time to chat about this. So um, your job is schedule controller. Does that mean that you're in charge of making sure all goes to plan? It's part of my responsibility, but you know, when it comes to scheduling, it's never one single person's job. It's actually a team exercise because planning means working coherently as a team. And us, the JUICE project team, we are quite uh, schedule oriented. We have a strong planning mindset. And um, even if you have the most perfect plan, you always have risk, you have uncertainty. And we saw that yesterday. So imagine if you take a step back, us in JUICE, we had to run our AAT campaign through a pandemic. And if you think of the industrial consortium, more than 2,000 people worked on this program, 23 countries, 18 institutions, 83 companies. Then you understand the complexity of project management that my colleagues and I have been performed on this mission and done a fantastic job so far. So uh, this is a, a personal journey for you. It's eight years, your entire professional life, because you're just a baby. Um, so tell us, how are you feeling today? I'm very excited. And um, yes, this is my entire career in ISA. And yesterday, as the project team, we received so much positive energy from home, from our science project. Thank you so much for your wishes. Everyone in Estec, we saw you how many were there. Mm. Thank you for your uh, support. Ezok, Ezak, the people on the spaceport, we managed to see our extended JUICE family, our instrument colleagues, and we spoke with them. So they gave us all the energy to go through the night and to keep JUICE uh, ready for the launch today. And thank you so much. Have you got a last word before we, we leave it here? Um, I wish everyone to enjoy the launch from, from all the teams who have worked on this amazing journey. As European, I'm exceptionally proud to be mm. part of it. And uh, let's enjoy the event of today. It's well deserved. Absolutely well deserved for your teams and, of course, all the other teams that you mentioned that have been working on this project. Thank you so much, Mihaela. Thank you. So um, as Mihaela was saying, a huge, huge amount of work from teams all over the world. Uh, we're going to find out more about these teams' achievements and, of course, about JUICE in the next film. Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, is a place that holds many secrets. This fascinating gas giant planet and its intriguing moons have raised more questions than answers. Today, these answers are in ESSA's grasp with the very first European mission to Jupiter, JUICE. Short for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, this spacecraft will explore Jupiter and three of its icy moons, Callisto, Europa, and in particular, Ganymede. Developed and built by Airbus, JUICE's spacecraft is equipped with 10 top-of-the-line science instruments to explore the Jovian system and investigate whether some of its many environments may be suitable for the formation of life. This grand odyssey of exploration begins with the launch of JUICE on an Ariane 5 rocket from Europe's spaceport in Kourou. 
an historical mission aiming at solving key mysteries such as the possibility of life in the Jovian system, Ganymede's magnetic field, and last but not least, the formation of Jupiter and its moons. JUICE will also study Jupiter's complex weather, chemistry, and climate in detail. It's a very fantastic mission from the scientific point of view. Very broad science, very interdisciplinary science. We would like to see whether around Jupiter, there are places where life could have started. To explore that, we need to find a place with internal energy and with liquid water. And inside the icy moons, we have good reason to believe that there is in fact more liquid water there inside the surface than on our own Earth. JUICE is expected to arrive at Jupiter in 2031 and will then make its Jupiter tour and moon's flybys before orbiting Ganymede. This will be the first time a spacecraft orbits any moon other than our own. During its journey, JUICE will face many dangers such as Jupiter's intense radiation belts or its large gravitational pull, but these dangers will be worth it for the science that JUICE will uncover. The gas giant will reveal some of its many secrets in 2032 when the first data will be available. Watch this space. So speaking of space exploration, we have two of the faces of human face exploration with us here today. I'm delighted to welcome once again Thomas Pesquet and Matthias Maurer. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us again today. It's a pleasure. Uh, so we're seeing Jews go up into space with these outstanding instruments. Um, what is it about sending this kind of instrument going out to space yourselves that helps us back here on Earth? First question uh, to you. Yeah, I think space exploration really in space ticks all the boxes. You've got all the short term benefits, you know, the things that we all use, that we all have in you know, our smartphones, the navigation, the weather report. And then you have the more medium term, I would say, applications. The reason we know today about climate change, the reason we're in position to fight climate change is thanks to all the missions we send around the Earth and observing the Earth. So that's kind of the more medium terms. Uh, space agencies are the champions or of fighting against climate change. And then you have the longer term, the longer term, the far reaching benefits for the future. And that's the research and the exploration we're doing, the research on board the space station, building better materials, you know, better medicine, better treatments. And it all diffuses in society on Earth and it's kind of make the progress, you know, go up one step at a time. And then those missions going far out into the solar system, it's really to look at ourselves, our place in the universe, how do planets form, where do we come from, where are we going? Those are very important questions and those are the type of questions that we're trying to solve with those missions. Fantastic. Well, we're talking about JUICE today that's going about to lift off and go on its mission, a long, long journey. But uh, what about uh, human space exploration? What are the next destinations? Well, I think the next des destination is very much the moon. I mean, the next big thing in space, uh, space exploration, human space exploration, is the Artemis program. He says a big part has a big part to play in Artemis program. We're providing the European service module to the Orion capsule. And that means one day we'll see European astronauts around the moon, on the moon. And so to prepare for this, we also have our robotic ex moon exploration. And then what we learn on the moon will put us in a position one day to go to Mars. And Mars is the twin sister of the Earth. That's where we learn a lot on ourselves. It had similar conditions. It has lost its atmosphere. Uh, liquid water also has disappeared. Can it happen to us? You know, those are important questions. And that's why we'll go to Mars first with our uh, probes, with our orbiters. And then one day with human exploration to Mars as the, the big prize money, the big goal, the big step. Fantastic. Wow. It's, uh, it makes you dream. Um, but um, of course, uh, what I would like to know from you, Matthias, is um, are you guys getting ready to take part in these adventures? Yes, so Thomas and I, we already flew to a low Earth orbit and flying to the moon. We uh, need to learn more because on the moon you need geologists. So we need to go out in the field and learn how to talk with, science, with the geologist, how to be the hands and the eyes of the geologist once we're on the surface of the moon. And ESA already started this training for European astronauts some years ago. And so we see continuously European astronauts going out into the field, learning all these skills. But we also need to develop facilities where we can train European astronauts what to do on the moon. And so in Cologne, we will now have the, the lunar, the moon training facility, which will enable like, to do all this training over there. And it will be so good that even hopefully the NASA astronauts will come over to train there like for the Artemis mission. So that's the, the big vision that we have. But it's not only learning for the moon. We also should um, 
like also keep in focus that we have European astronauts flying to the ISS. Andy Morgensen is getting ready to fly later this year. And we just started a new astronaut class. They will be flying to the ISS, hopefully, and to whatever comes after the ISS. So uh, are you, do you imagine yourself taking off from here, in, uh, spent from, the, uh, from the European spaceport here in French Guiana one day, Matthias? Yes, we are t uh, currently in times that are really like a revolution in space. And so Europe needs to step up and one of the big missions that we have, we need to become um, sovereign, to uh, become autonomous, also with access to space for Europeans from European soil. And uh, I think French Guiana is the ideal place to send Europeans on a European rocket in a European capsule to space. It's our big dream, Tomar and I, we would love to fly together uh, from here to lowest orbit, but maybe even also an European rocket further uh, towards the moon. And you said you'd be happy to welcome your NASA friends as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's like we should not forget um, spaceflight is also a soft diplomacy power. And uh, we will see very soon that China will invite foreign astronauts to fly to their space station. And uh, so we uh, Europeans, we are just learning that uh, in these times it becomes more and more important to be uh, um, on level field playing. And spaceflight definitely is also an important part in the, in the diplomacy area. Huge thank you, Matthias. And we have with us Josef Aschbacher. You are the Director General of ESA. Thank you for joining us. So in a nutshell here, what we've been talking about is Europe's capabilities for uh, independent launch. Uh, are you going to make this happen? You have 15 uh, yeah. seconds. <laughs> it's uh, not for me to make it happen. It's all the others to make it happen. But certainly, uh, we have been uh, working very hard on it. We have consulted uh, experts, independent experts, uh, to help us giving advice what this would mean uh, for Europe uh, as a unity of, uh, of all the countries, uh, the inspiration we would give, the economic benefits, the geopolitical strength uh, that would be portrayed uh, through such uh, an activity. So there's a lot of uh, interesting facets, and you have just heard Matthias and, uh, uh, and uh, Thomas uh, talking about those because it's so important, and yes, we're working on it. But uh, let's talk about shoes uh, because that's why we're here. Uh, also another uh, excellence uh, where Europe is really good and uh, let's look uh, how our satellites and our launches are doing. Thank you very much gentlemen, huge thank you. Thank you. And to talk about JUICE, I am joined by Raphael Chevrier from Ariane Space. Raphael is going to take us step by step all the way through every step of the mission. Raphael. Hello Liz. Hello, welcome to Road to Space and I'm going to let you take over from here and tell us what the next steps are. Yes, so this morning we are launching towards the east where we benefit from the slingshot effect given by the rotation um, of the Earth. So the uh, launcher performs a first uh, pitch maneuver in order to get us into the right direction. And only two minutes and 17 seconds after liftoff, the two boosters have done their jobs of providing the main thrust. So we don't need them anymore. They are detached from the launcher. Shortly after that, the fairing, which protected the spacecraft from the environment of the launch is also jettisoned as we have crossed the limits uh, of the atmosphere. Once the launcher reaches an intermediate orbit, the main stage is cut off and separated. So then the um, upper stage takes over, which engine is going to power for about 16 minutes in order to raise speed and altitude and release uh, juice on the targeted uh, orbit. So, by the way, the little towers that you see on the motion picture, they represent a chain of telemetry stations that are receiving data from the Ariane 5 in real time all along the flight path. After some orientation maneuvers, um, JUICE is separated on a liberation orbit. It means that it will have the required speed to escape literally the gravitational pull of the Earth. Then this is almost the end of the mission from the launcher, as we still need to perform some um, disposal maneuvers of the upper stage, but JUICE is only beginning its journey. ESA teams will use the North Sea ground telemetry station in Australia to acquire the signal from the spacecraft and take full control of it. One hour and a half after liftoff, JUICE will start deploying itself like a butterfly into space. First, it will unfold the large solar panels their total surface is 85 square meters. This is definitely bigger than my Parisian apartment. And uh, then in the following days, it will deploy its many antennas 
and probes. So the animation here doesn't depict the um, increasing altitude that Zeus is going to get, getting farther and farther from Earth on its way to its eight-year journey to Jupiter. Thank you so much, Raphael. It's all very clear. And actually, as uh, Raphael was speaking, uh, so you can see the pictures of Ariane on the launch pad. As Raphael was speaking, we hit the next milestone in our uh, video trans in, in our sorry in the chronology, which is of course the minus ten weather update. And yes. I'm looking at the board. All is green. I board have not is green right had anything now. in my earpiece. I don't see anyone picking up a mic. <laughs> so it's looking good so far. It is uh, green, and we're good to go. So uh, what we check, like Stefan said, we are usually checking the wind at high altitude, um, the wind in the vicinity of the launch pad, and also the risk of lightning. Yesterday, it is the risk of lightning that prevented us from launching, but today, everything's good. We're good to go. We can continue the operations. That sounds great. And continuing the operations means that we're heading towards what we call the synchronized uh, sequence. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so. There's another team, you see the teams working here, uh, final preparation on the way here in Jupiter Control, but of course there's another team at the Launch Control Center, which is much closer to the launch. It's about four, three, four kilometers to the launcher. And they've been working since last night, so they've not slept. Uh, tell us more about them. Well, these teams are monitoring all the operations during the final countdown. So for example, they are filling the cryogenic stages, they are cooling the Vulcan engine, that's the main um, engine of the launcher. Um, they are pressurizing the upper sphere, um, uh, upper stage sphere. This so is them hard work in the morning. Exactly. And I think the images were shot this morning, actually. Mm. And so it's all these operations that are leading, leading us to the start of the synchronized sequence. So what is this synchronized sequence, Raphael? Well, it's a real crucial step. You have 30 it's seconds. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to make it very quick. It's basically a succession of operations aimed at giving more and more autonomy to the launcher and to set it in its flight configuration. Yeah, because it's seconds. an irreversible. Uh, once we've started the synchronized sequence, we can't go back. No, That's so we're going. Absolutely. And we're going to now wait and hear. À tous de DDO, right. attention pour le début de la séquence finale lanceur. So there we heard it from the DDO, who is the range operations manager. We'll talk about him in a minute. And he's just announced the start of the synchronized sequence. Just a quick question. Why does it have to happen at minus seven? We were just saying. Well, I mean, this is obviously not a magic number. This is just the time for all these last minute operations to be performed. For example, we are topping up the, uh, and pressurizing the tanks. Um, we switch the power supply from ground to board. And only then, the uh, launcher is going to be fully awakened for launch. Fantastic. Um, for those who are, joining, who are joining us, we are six minutes and 20 seconds to lift off of Ariane 5, carrying juice on the first leg of its journey into space and towards uh, Jupiter. Uh, as Raphael was saying, Ariane, uh, we were talking about this earlier, Ariane normally launches uh, two passengers, but this time it's a single passenger. So can you just go quickly into what difference that makes for the, the launcher? Oh, for the launcher, this is so a very precious passenger, but for the launcher, it remains exactly the same. You have the two lateral boosters, you have the main stage, you have the upper stage, one fairing. We are also launching towards the east, which is the same direction as for standard telecommunication satellites. Only the final destination is a bit different. This is Jupiter. Um, so yeah, uh, it is the last time that we performed uh, such a, a single configuration. One of the last time was for launching the space telescope James Webb. Let's hope to the, today is going to be as flawless and smooth. Absolutely. And let's quickly now go into the film and have a look at the last couple of months of launch preparations. Four months ago, key elements of the Ariane 5 rocket arrived by boat on the coast of Kourou. They were carefully transferred to Europe's spaceport in large containers. These elements were then assembled in a dedicated building. Here we see the main core being placed into a vertical position, standing 31 meters high. The two solid boosters 
were attached to either side of the main stage. This was followed by the upper cryogenic stage hoisted into the air and lowered onto the main stage. The whole assembly was then moved to the so-called final assembly building. Juice arrived last February by plane in Cayenne, the main city of French Guiana. It then traveled an additional 50 kilometers to the spaceport for preparation. There, the spacecraft was removed from its container and carefully inspected in clean room facilities. Juice was then integrated onto the launch adapter before it was fueled, bringing its weight to just over six tons. The spacecraft was transferred to the final assembly building and mated on top of Ariane 5, some 35 meters above the ground. The launch preparation team got their last glimpse of the spacecraft as it was encapsulated inside the fairing, which has kept it safe and sound until today. On Tuesday, Ariane 5, with juice on top, was rolled out to the launch pad, where today it waits, poised in anticipation for its ascent into the sky. Uh, our passenger is sitting safe and sound, tucked under the fairing, as you can see, waiting for liftoff in just over two minutes. Well, Raphael, I have moved to the skybox overlooking the Jupiter control room, where, as you can imagine, everyone is intensely focused on the last couple of minutes to liftoff. And we can see here, as I was telling you, uh, the, so the, the crowds that were sitting in Jupiter control have now been asked to go out to the terraces on either side of the control room. They are among the lucky... Oh, so I didn't realize you could actually see us. We're sitting here in our skybox. So they're out on the terraces. Um, and they will be the lucky ones who will be able to see and also feel that launch, because trust me, you feel it. Uh, what are we going to see in the last few seconds before liftoff, uh, Raphael? Well, everything is going to happen quite quickly. So, like I said, the electrical power supply switch from ground to board. The cryogenic arms, which are feeding the upper stage with fuel, will see them retract six seconds before liftoff. The Vulcan engine will ignite first. We need to check it's working properly before we switch on the boosters. That's going to happen seven seconds later. So don't be surprised if you don't see anything during these seven seconds. Because, believe me, you will see and you will hear the launch. And you'll be hearing every milestone being called out by the DDO. He is the range operations manager, and his role is in an... Oh, we'll wait, we'll wait for the one minute, Mark, Raphael. À tous de DDO, attention pour moins une minute. Top H0, moins une minute. Right, so from here on, uh, no more commentary from us. Don't be surprised if it doesn't take off immediately because, of course, there are those seven seconds, Rafael. Exactly, so which, just enjoy the launch. During which the Vulcan engines are set on and then the launcher takes off. Go Ariane 5. Go Ariane 5. Enjoy. pour le décompte final 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 top allumage vulcain allumage AP décollage
La propulsion est nominale. La propulsion est nominale. And there, and there we, we go. We can, uh, we've seen the Ariane 5 lift off, roaring through the tropical sky, carrying juice on the first leg of her journey into space. And now she has disappeared under the crowds. And see there, in Kourou, there are many places from which to uh, to watch these launches. As you can see, the beach, uh, any place. Ah, and here we have we have a glimpse again of of the rocket. Raphael, it, it's an amazing uh, sensation for you as well, I'm sure. Yeah, even with the clouds, it's just... La trajectoire est nominale, tous les paramètres bord sont nominaux. It's really, really always impressive and it's an emotion to, to see it. So the video said that the trajectory is nominal, which means that it's working perfectly, it's going as planned. La and propulsion est nominale, le pilotage est calme. And in fact, just to, to, to sum up what the DDO does in, in three words, his responsibility uh, as far, he, he's the person who calls out every milestone along the way and he's in charge of providing uh, information on propulsion, guidance and trajectory. Exactly, he's like an orchestra conductor gathering all the information and summarizing it in real time and soon we'll have booster separation. We're waiting for confirmation from the DDO Separation des EOP. So the boosters have been safely separated. This is great. This is, they have provided 90% of the overall thrust of the flight. So they're doing the main job. And then soon we'll have the separation of the fairing. And by the way, you see a special drawing on the fairing right here. Children around the world will ask to submit Artwork La trajectoire est nominale. Inspired by Juice's epic journey, and on this fairing, we see one child's interpretation of Jupiter embracing our spacecraft. Everything is nominal. Tous les is paramètres bord sont nominaux. All parameters are going smoothly. And there we have it. We've seen it in our in our 3D animation. And we've just heard it from the DDO. Confirmed, so the fairing was used to protect the satellite from the friction of the air, but also from the noise generated during the ascent phase. We obviously need to safely separate the fairing, um, otherwise we would not be able to release juice into space. It also, means, it also means that we have crossed the limit of the atmosphere. So juice is on its way to be separated in about 20 four minutes from now. So by the way, so, yeah, we, we will have um, so the separation of the cryogenic stage when it has placed the launcher on an intermediate orbit. After this, I can mention that during, and we can actually see it on the motion design, um, because this is 3D animations here, um, that during the ascent phase, the launcher is set in what we call a barbecue mode, so it's slightly rotating on itself at a speed of 0 0.7 degrees per Le second. Est calme, la propulsion est nominale. So we do this so that every phase of the satellite is equally exposed to the sunlight. We just want to avoid overheating in one particular side of the spacecraft, which could damage the instruments. And as a matter of fact, when the upper stage is going to be injected on the targeted orbit. It will also rotate at a speed of 0 0.5 degrees in one direction, and then at the same speed in the other direction. Um, again, to avoid overheating on one part of the spacecraft, exactly like you know a barbecue. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and of course, there are the onboard computers. What are they measuring right now, Raphael? Well, they optimize the trajectory. The propulsion is nominal, the pilotage is calm. Everything is nominal, so they optimize the trajectory in real time. They minimize the propellant consumptions to bring the launcher to the intermediate orbit targeted at the end of the main stage propulsion phase. And as a matter of fact, we are accelerating a lot right now. 
So within the next three to four minutes, we go from, well, 3.5 kilometers per second to more than uh, seven kilometers per, per second. So how much is that per hour? Because you're That's the engineer. 25,000 kilometers per hour. And ultimately, juice will be separated at a speed of almost, of almost 10 kilometers per second. Uh, and uh, it will be separated at, alt at an altitude of 1,533 kilometers. Very precise. Okay. So the next milestone we are now waiting for, and we'll uh, be hearing this again from the DDO, is uh, the acquisition uh, by our downrange station of Natal. That is located in the, uh, on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. I'll just uh, wait and hear that from, from the DDO. He may not have uh, confirmed it uh, orally, but that. But by now. But just, just to explain, all along the route eastwards, iron is tracked from the ground. So the launcher's functions and vital signs are recorded and sent back to a network of stations that keeps constant watch on the health of the launcher system. And we have, we have it. the and confirmation of course, that the first... Apologies, of course, I did not mean Ascension. I meant Natal, Natal. over the border in Brazil, of course. That's the second and, downwind station. And just so you know, in all, that's about 1,500 parameters that is collected. Collected, my goodness. So that there's no way these uh, parameters can be analyzed in real time, Raphael. What happens to them? Well, the complete analysis is carried out in the weeks following the launch by a dedicated team. Um, they provide a wealth of information about how the vehicle performed during its mission. Um, and so this is why we constantly well, improve our knowledge of a launcher, launch after launch. And then that's why RN5 is such a reliable launcher. Mm. And so you were talking about the, uh, the stations, and it's a little bit, you were saying to me earlier when we were chatting, it's like a relay race, these stations, isn't it? These downrange. Uh, yeah. You were listening to the DDO. What did he say? I didn't hear him. He said that all the parameters are working perfectly. Nominal, that's what so we like So the flight is perfectly smooth. So yeah, this is like a relay race with one telemetry station passing the baton to the next one because we want to keep full visibility of the launcher in all dynamic phases of the flight. So the first stations to pick up the data was Galio, right here in Kourou, mm -hmm. followed by Natal in Brazil, then the, the island of Ascension in the middle of the Atlantic, and followed by Libreville in Gabon, and finally Malindi in Kenya. As the launcher crosses Africa. Nominal, two parameter nominal. So we have three different very short sequence right now coming up the cutoff of the main stage we should hear that the jettison of the main stage and then the ignition of the upper stage so it should be confirmed extinction vulcan separation epc and the ignition coming up yep waiting for the allumage of confirmé that's a very good news. That's a very important step. You should see the smile on Raphael's face. Time. You can't because we're in our little booth. Because we forgot to mention that we are now in the sky booth, uh, where we have a fantastic view over Jupiter, uh, where we can see uh, the crowds gathered. And uh, yes, and so you cannot see the smile on Raphael's face, but he is delighted that this uh, stage has gone perfectly. Yeah, the ignition of uh, upper stage is absolutely key uh, because it's always quite a little bit tricky to ignite a liquid stage in the emptiness of stage, of, of space, sorry. I told you that on the ground, we wait for a few seconds to check that the Vulcan engine is correctly ignited before, de visibilité par la station de Galio. before lift off. But in space, it's just not possible to do that. Uh, you cannot send somebody to repair the, the engine. Also in zero gravity, the propellant is floating in all directions. The thermal environment is also not the same as it is on the ground. So, you know, uh, there are many factors that make it quite challenging nominal, two bord nominal. and complex to ignite the engine in space. So, uh, 
we were mentioning earlier, this is the penultimate Ariane 5 launch, which for more than a quarter of a century has provided Europe with reliable and independent access to space, which Josef Ashbacher was talking about earlier. Ariane 6 will be taking over. Europe's best engineers are building on the success of Ariane 5, and there's already a fully integrated Ariane 6 on the launch pad right here in Kourou. Uh, Kourou. You're going to tell us about that, Raphael. So take, can you take us through the latest developments Absolutely. with Ariane 6? So last, last year was quite exciting for Ariane 6 uh, with the start of the what we call the combined test corresponding to the meeting between the launcher and the launch pad here La in Europe's spaceport. Here we see a fully representative version of Ariane 6 which has been assembled with the main core raised vertically, directed on the launch pad. The upper composite was then hoisted and mated on top of the launcher. This operational scheme is actually a big difference with respect to what is done with RN5. It is made possible thanks to this mobile gantry, which will obviously be removed during launch. And also, 2023 is going to be also a busy year for RN6, obviously. In January, the launcher was connected to the control bench, and a first power test was performed. Then dry run will be performed, followed by the actual fueling operations of the central port. Teams will also perform hot firing tests of the lower stage engine Vulcan 2.1, including a long firing test, and hot firing tests of the upper stage were successfully performed in 2022 and beginning of 2023 in Lampershausen at the German Aerospace Center. Next Plus ones are under preparation. Calme. So launcher elements that will be used for the Ariane 6 first flight will arrive in French Guiana using the new generation canopy vessel, which will be equipped with sails and hybrid propulsion. So that we can start the first real launch campaign of Ariane 6. And so today, the prototype of Ariane 5, Ariane 6, sorry, stands on the launch pad, ready to continue the combined test, so good luck for this very ambitious and incredible program. And Raphael, um, we heard while you were explaining all of this, we heard that the DDO called up loss of signal with the Natal tracking station. Now, there we go. And uh, didn't, we didn't hear that it had been, been picked up by the next station. Is that normal? This is perfectly normal uh, to have short visibility holes during non-dynamic phases of the launch. In this case, we have no visibility for just 63 seconds before the Ascension Ground Station speaks the signal back. So this should come in any seconds now. Acquisition de la télémesure par la station d'Ascension. Your timing is perfect. Confirmed. So we've been picked up by, by the next downrange station, that is uh, Ascension, the tiny little island in la the South est nominal, Atlantic, tous les and everything is nominal, the DDO is telling us. So from what I understand, uh, we're going back to Ariane 6, there's a very healthy order book already for Ariane 6 launches, Raphael. Yeah, Ariane 6 is already quite successful on the market, with already 28 launchers sold for both institutional and commercial customers. Uh, it is a very um, versatile, flexible launcher, perfectly suited for complex missions and satellite constellations deployment thanks to its high lift-off capability and its reignitable upper stage engine. La trajectoire est nominale, tous les paramètres bord sont nominaux. It's nice, to, uh, it's nice to hear the regular updates from the DDO that everything is going to plan. For those of you who are joining us, Ariane 5 lifted, lit, lit, sorry, lifted off 14 minutes ago, just over 14 minutes ago, from the European spaceport here in French Guiana, carrying ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer into outer space. We're bringing you this live show from the Jupiter control room, where the operational teams are overseeing the mission's progress. Juice is due to separate in about 13 minutes' time, but this is just the start of its long journey on its way to Jupiter. Let's find out more about the tech on board that will help it fulfill its mission. La propulsion est nominale, le pilotage est calme. At the heart of the Juice mission, led by ESA, is a giant bird-like spacecraft with large solar panel wings stretching out on either side of its main body. With a mass of 6,100 kilos at launch, JUICE is a heavy spacecraft carrying 10 high-precision instruments, 
including the most powerful remote sensing, geophysical and in situ payloads ever flown to the outer solar system. Building a spacecraft uh, which has to fly around Jupiter is a challenge. To operate a spacecraft, you need energy, you need power. And normally we get power from the sun using solar array. But around Jupiter, there is not much sun. Therefore, the solar array has to be very big. There is also another challenge. All the stuff that we built there has to survive very low temperature. And the third one is that the environment around Jupiter is very radioactive. That's why I think uh, the solar array, which is very exposed and put together this three difficult technology is really a great piece of engineering. Maybe a piece of art. The instruments were contributed by the JUICE mission scientific partner. The spacecraft was developed and built by Airbus and Ariane Group Savoir Faire equipped JUICE with the chemical propulsion system that will drive it to Jupiter and its icy moons on an eight-year cruise. We will provide the propulsion system for JUICE, which ensures that after leaving the launcher, it arrives correctly at Jupiter's moon and can work properly there. It's a fascinating thing, especially because the technical requirements of such a long journey, with so many constraints to consider, challenge each of us in a unique way. Engineers have devised advanced technological solutions so that JUICE can operate in extreme environments, face Jupiter's high radiation belt, the long distance and harsh temperatures. Its two and a half meter diameter antenna will send the data JUICE collects back to Mission Control, although it can take close to an hour to travel to Earth. The European Mission JUICE is going to be a real revolution. Its collection of valuable data will be used by scientists for years to come and help unlock some of the greatest mysteries of the universe. So, Raphael, JUICE is an emblematic oui, European bord, science mission. So, what is it about this particular mission that inspires you as a rocket scientist? Well, DREAM. And DREAM has always been a very strong driving Acquisition force. Acquisition par la station de Libreville. Uh, for me, but also for, I think, everybody who works in the space industry. And, uh, if we go on a more personal note, uh, actually, before working at Iron Space, many years ago already in my life as a space writer, I remember that one of my first real articles I wrote was about